TV isn't as good as it used to be or we're just getting served so much content now that it's harder to siphon through to find the actual good TV out there. Hi, my name is Catherine. I hope you're doing well. In today's video, I've done the hard work for you and I'm gonna tell you some TV shows that are actually worth your time. I'm actually really excited to make this video because it's been months since I made a video about TV shows or movies. I've watched some amazing TV shows recently and I've watched some bad ones. And more disappointingly so, these bad ones were second series or third series of shows that I loved. Bridgerton season three was a disappointment to me. House of the Dragon season two was a disappointment to me. I think there are a lot of reasons why, but that's not what this video is going to be about. I'm not gonna talk about why these particular seasons failed. There's plenty of YouTube videos out there that are already discussing this in a much more informative way than I have the ability to right now. But I recently watched a new TV show that I absolutely fell in love with and I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, but this TV show was cancelled after one season and it filled me with so much sadness, disappointment and anger. A TV show like this that is so original and fun was cancelled so unceremoniously when there are other TV shows that are much more expensive to make, that don't have nearly as good writing, that are being renewed for season three, season four. They're not getting good enough ratings for that. So anyway, because this happened and because I have watched some really good shows recently, I wanted to make a list for you of some TV shows that I think are actually deserving of your time and attention. I've got quite a good variety of genre and vibe so I think there will be something here for you. My first recommendation is the show that I was just referring to that has been cancelled after one season and it is My Lady Jane. R.I.P. R.I.P. This show was so incredible. It had me in such a chokehold and I was so convinced that it would get a season two. I watched it with my husband. We both really loved it. When the show finished, I turned to him and I was like, there is no question in my mind this will be coming back for a season two. I don't know if it was my algorithm that was just showing me videos of other people enjoying it. So I was getting the impression that it was being watched by so many people. I haven't looked into the ratings of it, but I don't think it did badly. I think it was canceled a month after it premiered on Amazon Prime. And I don't think it was given a fair enough shot. Especially when Amazon Prime is renewing Rings of Power for multiple seasons and I don't think that's doing well rating wise at all. The writing in that show and the storytelling in that show is just simply bad. It's so costly to make and it's only being made because of the success of Lord of the Rings and I love Lord of the Rings, okay? I love it but Rings of Power isn't a good show but that's not what we're here to talk about. My Lady Jane is a historical fiction show that is not historically accurate at all. It follows our main character, Lady Jane Grey, who's being forced into a marriage with Lord Guildford Dudley. The characters in this show are based on real life people. There was a Lady Jane Grey, there was a Guildford Dudley. One of the main characters is King Edward, who was the son of Henry VIII. It's set during a historical period that a lot of people are quite familiar with, but it turns history on its head by including magic. There are people in this world who have the ability to turn into animals, but they are ostracized in the society. They're called Ethians. They are essentially oppressed by non-Ethians in this world. This conflict is basically based on the real Catholic Protestant conflict that was happening at the time. This show is basically kind of a coming of age story for Jane. It follows her budding kind of enemies to lovers, forced marriage, romance with Guilford Dudley. It follows as she comes into her own as a woman and the new responsibilities she has to take on. And the heart of the show is basically all about love and accepting and embracing everyone's differences. This show is extremely silly but extremely fun and it doesn't take itself seriously at all. And because of that, the overall vibe of the show actually ends up being very genuine and warm. It also has such an amazing cast. Let's start with the two main leads who are played by Emily Bader and ooh, Edward Blumel. I hadn't seen Emily Bader in anything, but I do know Edward Blumel from Sex Education. He plays Maeve's brother. He has been in a lot of other TV shows and honestly his performance in this show has made me want to go out and watch all the other shows he's a part of just to see him act. He's that 
good. Emily Bader also has very excitingly just been cast as the main character in People We Meet on Vacation and I think that is such perfect casting because not only is Emily Bader extremely beautiful, she has such amazing comedic timing in this show. Her and Blumel play off each other so well, their dialogue is very short and snappy and laden with this sexual tension that like simmers from the moment they meet. But this cast doesn't stop with them. Rob Brydon is in this show playing Guilford Dudley's dad, which I wasn't expecting going into it, but he was incredible. Dominic Cooper of Mamma Mia fame plays Lord Seymour. Anna Chancellor, who I know from the BBC adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, plays Jane's mum. Honestly, the whole cast was picked so, so well. They all play off each other amazingly. Their styles fit the vibe of the show so perfectly. There's a narrator throughout the show as well who offers very funny commentary on the goings-on of each episode. This show was made for the Book Talk girlies and it is actually based off a YA novel, which I think I'm going to have to go and read. I think it's a series. Um, if we're not getting more of this show, then I'm going to need to find a fix somewhere. And I've actually seen snippets of the book on TikTok and it seems like it is just as funny as what the show is. The most important thing I want to say about the show though and kind of the inspiration for making this video is that this show was so flipping original and I don't think we're getting enough content that is purely original these days. I think producers and these big companies are wanting to make shows based purely on how well they're going to do money wise and the way they think to do that is by repurposing plots that they've used before or reusing a formula that they know has done really well in a particular area. This is why Marvel films have become so tiresome to watch because they're trying to recreate that magic that the original Marvel arcs had and you can't do that. You can't just put a new title on something and expect an audience to follow along dumbly. We need new original content and you could say that My Lady Jane draws comparisons to Bridgerton in the sense that it is a more modern interpretation of historical fiction but that is really where the comparisons end. Bridgerton did so well because it did put a new spin on the historical drama and romance and My Lady Jane has seen that viewers like that concept but instead of just spewing out a different version of Bridgerton they have made something entirely new and unique and creative in the way it's telling its story and fun, just overall fun. And I'm just so devastated that we're not going to be getting a second season of it because this show for me is what TV should all always be about is like taking risks and trying new things and being creative all in the pursuit of telling a good story rather than of making money. My favourite episodes in this show were probably the first two which were called Who'll Be Next in Line and Wild Thing. They were just really solid starts to the show. Set up the world so nicely, introduced these characters so well and of course set up this really dynamic romance between the two main characters. I love this show. The next show that I'm going to recommend to you is Silo which is on Apple TV and it is the most recent show I've watched. I actually just finished it last night so it is fresh, fresh on the mind. This is a dystopian sci-fi mystery drama in which humanity now lives underground in this silo that goes like hundreds of levels down deep. They live here because the ground above is toxic and uninhabitable. About 100, 150 years before the show starts, a rebellion took place and during this rebellion all the books, all the records, all of humanity's history was destroyed. So because of that the people in the silo don't know anything about why they're there. All they know is they can't go onto the surface or they'll die. The mystery of this rebellion and their lost history is the drive of this show. And I was tentative going into this because this is a story that we've seen before. A dystopian story where people live underground or have moved to space and there's this big lost history about humanity. That's not really a new concept. So I was wary about whether this was going to offer anything new or interesting, but it 
really, really does. The thing that really sets this apart from other dystopian shows or books that I've read is the world building is done very well. It's very intriguing. And I'm saying that in terms of both visually and the setup of the lore that's at the heart of the story. The visual of this silo underground with hundreds of levels, a whole civilization where it takes up to a day to get from one of the upper levels to like a mid level or a lower level. These visuals combined with the mystery of why these people are there, what's truly on the surface. Are they being lied to? Are they not being lied to? Are they there for their own good or are they there because someone wants to control them? All of these elements come together so well to, to create this very immersive world. The writing in this show is also incredible. I particularly love the way smaller characters who don't have as much screen time as bigger characters are written in such a way that you fall in love with them and you root for them. If you've already seen it, the main character I'm thinking of is Martha. I love her so much. I think it's always very impressive writing when you do root for these people that you don't spend as much time for. It makes them feel very real and in turn makes the world feel very real. But additionally, the main cast of characters is incredible. Rebecca Ferguson plays our main character, an engineer from the very lowest level in this silo who gets wrapped up in figuring out the conspiracies that are being hidden from their society. And Rebecca Ferguson is quickly becoming one of my favourite actors. I loved her in Dune, but I loved her even more in Dune Part 2. I loved her in Doctor Sleep and I loved her in this show. And they were all quite different characters as well. She plays this woman who is very smart, very physically strong, but at times is very vulnerable and confused and doesn't want to be doing what she's been wrapped up into doing. Another great character is Paul Billings, who's played by Janaza Uchi, who is Scottish. He was born in Edinburgh. I didn't know that at all until I was looking up stuff for this video. He has an American accent in the show. I had no idea he was Scottish. He plays a police deputy who is very by the book, who has been very much brought up and kind of groomed into this system and this way of belief. And his character is really interesting because he has such a good heart and strong beliefs that you can see him battling with because he starts questioning what he's been told and who he should believe and you can really see this internal struggle with him. Like I said, Harriet Walker who plays Martha, she's incredible. She's one of my favourite characters who gets like a bit less screen time. And then Rashida Jones, who is in the very first episode, who we know from more comedic roles, kind of plays this character who sets off this string of events for the rest of the season and her performance is excellent. If you like dystopian stories and you haven't watched this yet, this is one to definitely check out. And very excitingly, the second season is coming out in November, so now is the perfect time to watch it and catch up. My favourite episode of season one was the third episode called Machines, in which Rebecca Ferguson's character is having to fix the generator that runs the whole silo before it fails. It's very tense, very fast paced and really showcases the great writing and acting in the show. Next up is a show that it has actually been a while since I've watched it but season two is coming in January and it's highly anticipated by a lot of people including me so now is the time to watch it if you haven't and why? I'm gonna sell it to you right now. This is Severance which is also on Apple TV and is also a dystopian sci-fi but not the kind of dystopian that Silo is. This is much more near future in which there is a new technology where you can opt into a severance program, which basically means you can get this kind of switch in your brain that allows you to go to work for this company. And as soon as you walk through the doors, the switch will go off and a different version of you will encompass your body. So it's still you, but it's a you who doesn't know about your life outside of work. And you'll spend the day there doing your job. As soon as you come out of work, the switch goes off and you're back to the you you are outside of work and you have no memory of what goes on inside of work. So you are the same person, but you're just, there's a work version of you and there's a personal version of you and the two do not cross. Not only is there a great mystery at the centre of this show, there's a number of great mysteries at the centre of this show, but the show also explores themes of consent and oppression and really interesting questions about 
if you're this person who has these two lives, who don't know about each other, but you still are the same person, but your work persona only knows work, is that unfair? Or does it not make a difference because it's still you? It's still you who's made this decision. What I find really interesting about the show is that it is definitely a very serious drama, but it has quite a lot of people connected with comedy involved in it. So the main character, Mark, is played by Adam Scott, who you'll know from Parks and Rec. Half of the episodes are directed by Ben Stiller, and he's an executive producer as well. I think the decision to cast Adam Scott who has such a recognisable face and is so recognisable to people as a comedy actor in this serious role is very good because you go in with these preconceptions of him which are turned on their head and it really adds to this kind of uncanny valley vibe that is present throughout the show. This kind of feeling that this world that is quite recognisable to us, it's like not far away from what we know, but has this darker side to it. It's about people who have two sides to them, who live completely different lives in the same body, you start questioning whether they're the same person or not and why is it fair that your person outside of work gets to dictate what your person inside of the work is doing and how they are living their lives. Watching this show feels weird and it makes you feel unsteady and uneasy and it's great as well because this is very much an ensemble cast. The characters in this show all play a vital role. The plot of season one kicks off basically with the arrival of a new employee in this workplace called Hallie who from the get-go does not want to be there. She is putting in requests to not work there anymore which are being denied by herself, by her being who exists on the outside. And this conflict between Hallie's two personas kickstarts the kind of unravelling of this big mystery at the centre of this company. And within this office as well, the kind of mysteries and lives of the four main characters who work in the office. And each one of them is great. Gwendolyn Christie is going to be in season two. Learned that today. That's going to be amazing. And I've got to say, this is just one of the most unique stories that I've ever consumed. You are always right there with the characters, discovering things as they discover things. So that makes you on the edge of your seat through all of it as everything starts unfolding around you and more questions start getting raised and more confusion. And it's kind of like the same vibe in that sense as the earlier seasons of Lost. So if you love that show, then I definitely think you'll love this one. Also, the opening theme and credits for the programme is so, so good. I love it. And my favourite episode, I think, it's been a while since I've watched, but I just think the finale of season one, so tense, so good. The reveal, if you haven't watched Severance, go watch Severance before January. You won't regret it. Next up, let's talk about Interview with the Vampire, which I've not finished yet. I'm watching with my husband and we're halfway through season two. I also haven't watched the film and I don't know whether if I'd watched the film, I would have different feelings about the show or whatever, but I haven't. So these are my feelings about the show with no kind of prior context of the story. I do want to watch the film, but it's not on anything to stream right now and I don't really want to buy it. Interview with a Vampire is what it says on the tin. We're set in present day in Dubai during the pandemic. Daniel is a journalist who has been invited by an old friend Louis who looks to be about in his 20s. We quickly learn that Louis is a vampire. They have a history that I think is is explored in the interview with the vampire film. They have done an interview together before that didn't end very well and Louis has invited Daniel back to do another interview and to get the true story out straight. And so the show is split between two timelines. We've got the present day with Daniel and Louis and then we've got the past showing the events that Louis is telling Daniel from him turning into a vampire, his relationship with the vampire who sired him called Lestat, his relationship with another vampire who comes in called Claudia and moves in with them. This is the most interesting vampire show 
I've watched in a long, long while. And it's quite rare when you've got two timelines going on simultaneously that I enjoy both timelines as much as the other, but I really do in this show. And I think it's down to the fact that usually you would like, in this example, the past timelines more because there's more happening in them. We're getting the history of the character, we're getting a story. But in this one, I really do enjoy the actual scenes of the interview because the chemistry between Daniel and Louis is so palpable. They play off each other very well. There's a very interesting dynamic because Daniel is dying. So that kind of fear of being in the room with literal death isn't there for him. He, he doesn't have anything to lose basically. He is just there to do his job and so he's not afraid to speak back to Louis and tell him how it is and question him on difficult things. So we've got a really interesting dynamic right from the bat between these two characters. That being said, the driving relationship of this show is between Lestat and Louis and this kind of tortured, toxic, romantic relationship between these two men. One, an older vampire who has sired this other vampire and who has forced him into this life. And they love each other so much, but they also betray each other. And I've got to say, the character of Lestat is incredible. I love him. <laughs> and the actor who plays him, oh, what's his name? Sam Reed plays Lestat. He is just captivating. Any scene he's in, so good. He just plays this kind of evil but charming, very smooth, easily angered, doesn't like to lose, doesn't like to be questioned, always wants to be in control. At times he is basically like a child with too much power, the way he acts, and it's so so captivating to watch. I also love Claudia who comes into it in it's either episode three or four which is my favourite episode. It's called The Ruthless Pursuit of Blood with All the Child's Demanding. This is Claudia's introduction and this was the episode where I was in. The first few episodes it took me a while to kind of get into it but as soon as Claudia came in and the way she switches up the dynamic between Lestat and Louis and causes a rift between them but then also brings them together as a family unit and kind of explores the complexities of what it means if a teenager becomes a vampire. It's all just very interesting to me and her scenes are so funny and also so heartbreaking. She's a great character. They do change the actor who plays Claudia in season two and that did throw me for a loop a bit, I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, that episode is my favourite so far, but bear in mind I've not finished season two yet, so that might change. But this show is just a very interesting take on a classical vampire story. If you like like a gothic horror, then you'd love this show. Finally, a very different vibe from Interview with a Vampire, I'm gonna recommend Maxton Hall. Unlike My Lady Jane, this is a show that is very silly and takes itself very seriously, but in a way that wouldn't work with My Lady Jane. It kind of works. It kind of evokes that feeling you have in high school where everything is very high stakes and very high drama and everything matters so much because you're a teenager with all these hormones and confusing feelings. So you do take everything very seriously. And I feel like that's what this show does. It's like, this is very silly. And these characters are, being so overdramatic, but I do believe it. So this show is a high school show. It is strange. I was really confused when I started it because it's a German show on Amazon Prime. I think I watched it dubbed. So you can watch it dubbed or subbed, but it's a German show. So I started watching it like, okay, German, why, why is this so English though? It feels like we're in like a posh area outside of London and England with all these like rich kids. And that's because it is. Basically, this is also based off a YA series of novels called Maxton Hall. It's written by a German author, but it's set in like the English countryside and it's basically like kind of like gossip girly, I guess. But that was very confusing not having that context and thinking that it was meant to be set in Germany but not getting the German vibes from it at all. Once I understood that, it was much easier to fall into what the show was. But yes, so this is set in a kind of rich school in England. And our main character is Ruby Bell, who is not rich at all. She is in the school on a scholarship, surrounded by 
rich families who look down on her because she's not rich. And the show is basically all about her falling for this rude, arrogant guy who she's kind of forced proximity with called James Beaufort. And that's basically what the show is. It's just lots of drama, lots of angst as we follow their budding romance as he learns that being rich doesn't mean you're better than everyone else. And she learns that rich people have problems too. <laughs> I wasn't lying when I said this show was silly, but it is very watchable, very fun, really good high school drama. It is very Germaine fanfic come to life. So if you like Draco Hermione pairing, if you like fanfic, if you like fanfic vibes, this is gonna itch that scratch for you. It really does help that the main character in this show is bright blonde hair, so he's very very Draco-esque, but he's really got that kind of arrogant, rich energy going for him. And then Ruby Bell has this very Hermione-esque energy where she's like there on a scholarship and she's looked down upon by the rest of the school because she's not the same as them. And she's very clever, very smart. She stands up to him. But this show is basically just high school drama at its finest. It's got a great soundtrack. It's got really great chemistry between the two casts. I didn't love the dub version of it. I think maybe I would prefer to watch it subbed. Her sister's dubbing was very annoying. The voice actress <laughs> was just really bubbly and loud and it just didn't quite mesh with what I was watching. But apart from that, I did really, really enjoy it. And my favourite episode... Mm, what was it? My Oh gosh, it's in German. Blog Gestelt. Episode 3. Shall I translate it? Expose. What a good episode title. Yeah, episode three is kind of a breakthrough in the relationship between Ruby and James, when they start kind of acknowledging these feelings for each other. It's just very, very angsty, romantic, sexual tension. Why a fun? <laughs> Prime has renewed it for season two, which I am happy about, but I'm also like, if you can renew Maxton Hall for season two, why can't you renew My Lady Jane? I'm still holding out hope that like we maybe get a manifest situation where Netflix picks up My Lady Jane for a new season. But now I'm worried that Emily Bader's been cast in this big Emily Henry adaptation rom-com film. The actors are gonna get too big and not wanna come back to do this TV show. It's very unlikely that it get renewed or picked up anywhere else anyway. And that's that. I hope that you've got some good recommendations, some things that feature interest. All of these shows are very different. But the thing that all of them has in common, I think, is they have a really clear idea of what it is they're trying to do in telling their story. They have a really clear voice. They have really clear direction. And I think that is what is lacking in some of these bigger shows that are being produced because they think they're going to be big money grabbers. But really, in that process, they're losing some of the magic. Let me know what you think of these shows. Let me know if you have any recommendations for me based off what you can gather from the type of things I like to watch from this video. I hope that you have an amazing upcoming week and I will see you in the next one. Bye!